So we learned a lot about Apple's new software plans here at WWDC 2019, and I want to specifically dig into what's happening with iOS 13. Now, I'm not going to run through literally everything that's going on in the software update. We're going to get a full feel for it starting this July when the public beta rolls out and more broadly when the software goes live for everybody in September. But there's a lot going on here that I think we should really dig into right now. Let's take a closer look. Now we have to start with dark mode mostly because it's on every other phone or at least it feels like it. Now it's finally coming to iOS. And the name basically does exactly what it suggests. It turns all of those white bits in iOS black or some shade of gray because as Apple was keen to note, there are different layers of colors here. So you're not looking at straight black all of the time. Apple has not issued any guidance on whether you can expect your battery to be better because as you may or may not know, the OLED screens that you'll find in devices like the iPhone XS and XS Max are OLED basically. So they don't actually turn on to display the color black. That should lead to some battery gains, but Apple isn't really willing to talk about it. I will say that after seeing this thing in action a little bit, seeing the transition from the light to the dark mode, learning that you're able to set these things on a schedule so you can have the dark mode kick in automatically at a certain time, it feels really nice. And it actually is a lot easier on the eyes than expected. It's maybe not the biggest deal in the world to a lot of you, but it's something a lot of people have really wanted, and I'm glad it's finally here. Apple Maps has also gotten a really big update, and I know what you're thinking. Apple Maps has historically not been the greatest mapping platform in the world, and Apple, to their credit, is very well aware of that. They basically tried to rebuild their mapping system from the ground up, and now we're looking at a much cleaner, much more thoughtful version of Apple Maps that, in addition to all of that, has its own Street View competitor. Basically, in certain compatible cities, you're able to zoom in on a slice of the map, hit a binocular icon, and basically use what feels like Google Street View. The difference is Apple's approach is dramatically crisper, dramatically smoother. As you're moving down a street, for example, you're not getting those weird jerky transitions. It all kind of feels like you're walking down the street, albeit if cars just sort of disappeared while you did that. It's actually really slick, and I don't know that it necessarily would make a convert out of me, but it's enough to make me rethink the entire strategy. I mean, Apple clearly cares enough to put this much effort into maps going forward, I think it's at least worth another shot, right? There are a few other smaller feature comforts I do want to bring up. Uh, Apple Photos has a really nice redesign that I think really nicely makes use of the entire uh, iPhone display. You have photos, or at least the edges of photos that would normally appear in that space, kind of jutting up past where the clock and the signal indicator are, which I thought was a really nice touch. Uh, we also have the, I believe it's called the Quick Path Keyboard. Basically, it's Apple's version of Swipe or the Google Keyboard where you can trace out words and actually have them appear directly into your text input box. It works surprisingly well, at least from what I've seen. They have not let me touch the thing, but it's there if you want it. The most important thing that I've noted so far isn't actually exclusive to the iPhone, but I do feel like we need to talk about it right here. It's sign in with Apple ID. And I think it's worth mentioning here because this is something I would use almost exclusively on my iPhone. Basically, if you didn't kind of get the keynote, whenever you try to sign into an app or a service, instead of signing in with these social buttons, which are in fairness, very convenient, but do kind of shed a little bit more light on you as a user than you might necessarily want, you're able to just sort of sign in anonymously you authenticate yourself with your Apple ID. Apple provides whatever service is involved with a long fake decoy email address. Everything that the service sends to that email address gets forwarded to your original Apple ID account, and it all feels pretty seamless. Now, I should point out, you have the option to give whatever company, whatever service, whatever app that you're using in this case, your actual email address if you really trust them. But here's the thing, though. It seems so thoroughly put together on Apple's end I can't imagine wanting to do that. If the alternative is having a really seamless way to access all of my services and still get customized performance because everything is still tied back to this one unique fake email address that Apple's provided, it still treats you like an individual. It still customizes whatever services are involved. It just doesn't know that it's necessarily you on the other end. If that's the alternative, why would I ever give anyone my email address or any of my credentials like that ever again? Obviously, there is a lot more to dig into on iOS 13. We're really looking forward to getting our chance to play with it, which will unfortunately come later this summer. But check out Engadget.com for more insight and detail into what Apple's new mobile software brings to the table. And thanks for watching.
Thank you.